Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon, and this is the Breaking Free Show. And I am so delighted that you are here with us today. We have a very exciting, and it's going to be busy show. So keep your keep keep your eyes on the screen. Get a pen in hand because I'm sure that there are going to be some things you're going to want to write down and invite anybody you want. Call them up on the phone right now, everyone, because we're talking about equality. And today we are going to celebrate Women's Equality Day. And it just happened to turn around today. We didn't know it when we booked this show, but we do now. So we're really excited. So before we get on with our show, I just want to say hi to Anan. Hello, Marilyn. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm fine. You're enjoying the weather finally? Yeah. Oh, my God. It's lovely. Yep. I could be outside and my hair is not frizzing and all that stuff. Yep. It's lovely. Very I nice. love it. And can eat outside. It's been really beautiful. So on with our show. Please remember that you are welcome to connect with us. And today we have a very busy show. So if you would like to comment, ask questions, whatever you like, please join us in our chat. You can put your name under our video and nickname, whatever you like. You can ask questions there. We will monitor it and we will ask away. So we have April. We have two Saharas. And we have Mary joining us today, and maybe we might even have a Teresa. So I want to welcome all of you here today. Hey, everyone. Hi. Hey. Hey. Hey, it's nice to have you all. Hi. Thank you. So I'm going to ask, first of all, I'm going to ask April, who's been on our show before and we love. April, hi. Hi. Happy Women's Equality Day. Happy Women's Equality Day to you. I, I, any equality day is everybody's equality day, I feel like. So first of all, tell everybody who you are, April. I'm April Young Bennett. I'm the host of the Religious Feminism Podcast. I'm the author, author of Ask a Suffragist, Stories and Wisdom from America's First Feminists, and I'm a Mormon feminist. Which is an interesting combination at that, right? So why it's don't you? Very needed. It's very yeah. So go ahead if you will and start to introduce our other guests so we can get on with our conversation. Great. Today we have Zahara Khan and Zahara Yubi with us from Feminist Islamic Troublemakers of North America, and we have Mary Dispensa from the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests. You might remember them from the movie Spotlight. That was the activist group that was highlighted in in that movie, and. If we're lucky, I think we have Teresa coming on right now. Teresa and Yugar is part of Women's Ordination Conference and the Roman Catholic Women's Priests. So good. And we have Mary. Oh, you said did I did you, introduce Mary. Oh, you did. Okay. I just want yeah. to make sure. Okay. I'm, okay. <laughs> Perfect. We don't want to forget everybody, right? Okay. So let's go around so everybody knows who everybody is. So Teresa, hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks you the, for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So you're the, are you a troublemaker? I would say so. Okay, good. We're going to get to that in a minute. That might be, have to be my first question. Okay, so you hold on tight. Sahara, uh, are you here? Sahara, uh, uh, Sahara from Dartmouth, right? Are you oh, here? Yes. yes. Hi, I'm here. Say hi. Okay, so you said hi. Now the other Sahara. Is Sahara here? Hey, there she is. I'm here. Sorry, I had yeah. myself on mute. Okay, yeah. perfect. Well, we're going to call you Blue Hat Sahara. No, not really, but welcome to you. And Mary, do you want to say hi? I do. Good morning, everyone. I, I'm just thrilled to be here with the others and uh, to have this opportunity. Thanks. Well, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you all here. And may this be the beginning of many times together. Yes. So, April, start us off. What is the the central core of this particular group? Uh, We're all religious feminists, so we're working within our faith communities to make them more egalitarian, a little less patriarchal. And these are all amazing women that we have on this panel today who have done great things within their communities to promote the cause of women and, of course, humankind, because we all know that women's rights are human rights. Exactly. So, Sahara Yubi, why don't you start? Tell us about your work specifically and what you are involved with and how, you know, how today matters so much to you. Well, um, well, thanks for having me. Um, I am a professor at Dartmouth, so a lot of what I do is teaching and research and writing. Um, and my area of specialty is uh, gender and Islam and particularly um, gender and Islamic ethics and Muslim thought, um, as well as 
uh, studying Muslim feminist movements and so on. Um, so I teach about that and I find that teaching is a big part of my activist work because um, because being a scholar, scholar activist is, is an important part of, of my identity and, um, and what I hope um, is I can impart to students, um, college students of, of today. Um, and it's and they're not just Muslim students, obviously. Um, at Dartmouth, there's, there's a full diversity of students, and um, people who come to my classes are already sort of self-selected. But also, many students who don't necessarily know much about Islam and um, who want to uh, educate themselves about um, gender debates within the Muslim tradition. Um, so I find that my work in the classroom is uh, both to educate, but also create awareness about right now and contemporary issues um, surrounding gender debates, um, not limited to the Muslim tradition, not limited to Muslim communities, um, but certainly that's a big part of what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also, my, my research work is on um, on on these topics, and I just wrote a book, uh, Gendered Morality, Classical Islamic Ethics of the Self, Family, and Society. Um, and in, in that work is basically um, sort of a feminist critique, if you will, of, um, of gender discourses within the Islamic ethics tradition, pre-modern Islamic ethics tradition that is still very relevant today. Um, and so that's that scholarly life, I think, scholar teacher life is a big part of my life, my, my big part of my time. Um, and then in terms of my community, um, certainly all of these debates come to the fore um, when I uh, participate in um, my local Muslim community, um, as well as in, I mean, I'm from Boston and so the Boston area as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very important, and first of all, that we are talking about this because there are times that I'm not sure that freedom and liberation and equality exists in in some communities. So it's important that we do talk mm -hmm. about it and we do get we do realize the truth. So thank you, Sarah, so much for explaining it. So, um, okay, Teresa, you're on. So why don't you go next? Okay. Well, similar to Sar. Okay. So the work that I do is within the Roman Catholic tradition. And the um, impetus for my passion about women being ordained in the Catholic Church is because I felt called to be ordained within the Catholic Church. And that then I would end up pursuing a master's degree in feminist theology and learning about how women have been marginalized in the church by Christian traditions or different doctrines. But so m a lot of my work is just reframing the um, reframing textual or historical um, interpretations about women's involvement in the church. And so I'm through that, I'm involved with the Women's Ordination Conference through in Washington, D.C., which is a national organization that was founded, I want to say, in 1976 or 1977, when women at that time wanted, in the Catholic Church, wanted to be able to have a space to have that conversation. And it paralleled a conversation with the Episcopal Church at that same moment in time, where there was 11 women that were ordained illicitly by um, a bishop. But the thing is, because those women were ordained, you cannot undo an ordination. So I've been working with the Women's Ordination Conference. There's also another group that many people may not know about, the Roman Catholic Women Priest Movement, which actually is an interesting movement um, that again, um, we had women that were ordained by bishops in Europe, and then those bishops came to the United States and ordained women. And when you ordain, when individuals are ordained by a bishop, you can undo it. But so I'm a part of movements within the Catholic Church that I would say for the most part are on the margins, but are radically trying to re, re, reaffirm the authentic teachings of Jesus, which was radical inclusiveness. So yes, my scholarship has to do on ecclesiology, the study of church, my book on uh, 17th century Latina feminist, eco-feminist, Sir Juan Inez de la Cruz, reflects on how um, her Nova Hispana feminist perspective was very inclusive. 
so because she embraced her Nahuatl Mexican heritage, her indigenous background, her Spanish and the um, non-Spanish individuals in her 17th century historical moments. Mm -hmm. So my scholarship and my activism kind of parallel, but it comes from my personal experience of wanting, feeling disempowered as a woman that because God is gendered in as Jesus is gendered male, then women have been historically undermined in terms of our divinity. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting, and then we're going to introduce the rest, but I find it interesting to say that once you're ordained, you're ordained, and yes. no matter what, even a woman. I mean, I guess when they made that rule, they didn't even include women, but what can you, if you, if you don't include women now, what can, you know, what will happen? So interesting point. So let me, let me go right to Mary, because that kind of goes into, Mary, what about you? Well, I am a first a, a survivor of none abuse and priest abuse and uh, spent over a half a lifetime in the Catholic Church. And my present work is um, I'm a leader for SNAP in the Northwest and a contact for those abused by nuns. So all of this work, of course, is uh, about destroying the power, I guess, that exists, especially in the clergy, as they um, hide and protect sex abuse and breaking that down is, is something that, that I, I do as I work with each survivor and they begin to find their own voice and tell their own truth and finally speak truth to power. And as you know, it's a, it's a lifetime work. Um, I grew up in East Los Angeles. Um, I was uh, abused by the priest when I was seven. I went in, uh, to Catholic high school. I entered the convent when I, right out of high school, I stayed for 15 years. Eventually ended up directing the pastoral life services department for the Catholic archdiocese for some unknown reason. I finally faced my sexual orientation as, as while I was directing the pastoral life services department, and that was not the best place to come out. Um, and I did indeed, and I was fired. And so I had a um, moment of really understanding um, the power, the power of the Catholic Church, and the hierarchy and the patriarchy. And that uh, threw me into a lot of work and involvement on behalf of the LGBT community, then Q community. Then finally, I faced my abuse by the parish priest and eventually the nun, and then began to give all of my passion and commitment and volunteer work to helping others find their voice, speak their truth, reclaim their lives. Um, mm -hmm and move on in freedom and equality. Thank you for, I mean, it's just amazing to hear all of you. And I have a question for you, Mary, but before I go, I want to welcome um, Sahara also, and just give us some of what your background is too, and bring us up to date. All right. Um, so first of all, I'm going to apologize a little bit for the noisy environment. I'm actually at the hospital today getting some treatment, but I wanted to join this. Um, so uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the Feminist Islamic Troublemakers of North America, um, and for which the acronym is FITNA. And um, FITNA is an Arabic word that's um, translated like it's um, usually as like sedition, corruption, temptation, discord, all these various meanings that, you know, amount to trouble. Um, and it's something that's sort of leveled at Muslim feminists from like within the community, um, from people who are very sexist. And sometimes all women are sort of called the fitna for men because women are a temptation. And so we wanted to take that word and turn it around on its head and um, make it into something positive. And the way we're defining our organization is uh, we're focusing on creating constructive disruption around gender issues in the Muslim community. And so that's sort of like the umbrella of the work that we're doing now. My, my own background is I'm a, I'm a lay person in the Islamic studies space, but I'm an engineer by training and I work on Mars exploration. Um, but uh, what I, you know, I do this at, in my spare time to 
uh, really bring the work of scholars such as uh, Zara Yubi and other people to the Muslim community because scholars like uh, Zara are um, neglected in terms of like invitations to mosques and even panels that um, you know, like interfaith organizations may convene, they're often inviting imams from the mosques. And as you may know, like probably more than 90% of mosques have male imams and many people would say that you can't have a female imam. And so a lot of this um, discourse that, you know, this really rich discourse that um, uh, Dr. Yubi and others are part of, that's really left out of Muslim communities and non-Muslim communities. And so um, my hope is to really be sort of like the hype woman to bring all this like um, rich information out to the Muslim community and the wider um, community in uh, the US and Canada. And so some of the things that we've done is we had a conference in Boston when I was living there um, where we brought together uh, scholars and activists from all over New England to talk about Islamic feminism. Um, and we also um, have held some events where lectures by um, Islamic feminist scholars um, in California now that I've moved here. Um, and then some uh, online campaigns where we've worked with other organizations to put out statements and articles in support of uh, sexual abuse survivors within the Muslim community. So these are people who've uh, suffered from like spiritual abuse, uh, from uh, Muslim leaders, and uh, and it's one of those uh, play things where we're in a really difficult place because um, the community is afraid of talking about some of this for fears that uh, Islamophobes will take that information and try to like malign the Muslim community as a whole uh, for us raising these questions. And so we're in this difficult place where we have where these there are these concerns that women have, but it's kind of hard to raise them in the environment. Uh, that we live in here in the U.S. where um, there's a lot of Islamophobia and racism that we have to tackle with and we have to be careful how we approach that so we don't make that kind of thing worse. Well, you want people to listen. And, you know, people are not going to listen if, you're, if we're yelling at them. I, I, I mean, I believe that it has to come out in the right way. So my question to, and let me start with April. How, um, I look at all this and say we're doing great. How are we doing, April? We are doing great. Uh, women have more rights than ever before. I mean, we haven't reached the pinnacle. There's still a long way to go, but I do think that there's a lot of progress in the movement. And I think that when you look at any movement, we want to see it going just up, up, up. Everything's better, better, better. But what we usually see more often is a sense of there's two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. And so sometimes we're going to see some reactions and we're going to see some setbacks and things are going to go back a little bit. But I do think that overall, in the long run, we are moving in the right direction and it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, a, I mean, for me to have all of you here, you know, from, you know, you each have a, um, a working in similar goals, but a different mm -hmm. piece of the puzzle, which I find to be very exciting. And I know that there's more of you. You know, I mean, there's there's more of you from different religions, walks of life that could come on and also share. So, you know, I, I do want to get some more fine tuning and understand more about what paths we're taking and what else we need to do. Like, what do we need to do? Like just a layman like myself or anybody, what do we need to do? So um, Sahara, I, uh, so she, you know, we, she mentioned that you were a scholar. And you're working on these things. So what, you know, what do you see with your kids that you're, you know, in school? I mean, what questions are they asking? I think um, uh, what Zahra Khan was um, getting at is a really important point that I want to pick up. Okay. And that is also related to my students as well, which is um, that there is this tension between um, being able to talk about things that are ugly within a community, um, with, you know, include which are not limited to, but certainly, um, especially uh, gender inequality or um, patriarchal practices and things like that, um, to be able to, so there's a tension between being able to talk about those issues and also safeguard oneself and one's community from, um, being vulnerable to racists and um, anti-Muslim uh, sentiment and Islamophobes and so on. Um, and I think 
even with students and the questions that they are asking sort of are indicative of the place where they are coming from. So there's so many students, and I'm talking about um, students who are not heritage students, so like non-Muslim students, right? Um, who are who want to be allies, who want to be, um, who want to understand. Mm -hmm. um, many of the questions that they're asking are coming from a very, uh, how should I put this? A very um, uh, concerned and uh, very um, genuinely uh, genuine place of wanting to be allies and wanting to be helpful and wanting to learn more and to, to be able to create awareness. But much of those um, questions also indicate um, a kind of mm -hmm. ignorance as far mm -hmm. as as far as the Muslim community, as far as the particular issues that Muslim women might encounter within within a, a given community um, or within a given family or whatever. And so there is this, um, so that tension between vulnerability to, to, you know, from vulnerability as well as um, wanting to actually make change um, is definitely present within student life as well, because mm -hmm. the students are at the same time combating their inner racist or inner biased um, assumptions that they might be walking in with and because someone is feminist or because someone is you know wanting to help women make change or muslim women make change doesn't necessarily take away some of the um, you know, some, some bigoted assumptions that people might be right. walking into. It. What I'm hearing is, and correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, anybody, and please feel free to engage also, is the fact that you're, you're not only, mm -hmm. you know, carving out to create equality for women, but you're having, you've got this umbrella, whether it's Muslim, mm -hmm. whether it's Islam, whether it's a priest. I mean, you've got these umbrellas that you've got to clean up too. I mean, because mm -hmm. we all, ha I mean, we have judgments about all of this, you know, overall, and you're having to clean it. So I, I think you're having to clean some of that up in order to, to create your own, your e equality path for women. Well, one of the things that April said um, is that, you know, we all know that women's rights are human rights, right? And yeah. so I think, yeah, and I think that that's, that's certainly a really important sentiment um, that might go in tandem with, say, intersectionality, which is basically this idea that um, women are not just women, right? They are also other things. They are also um, from, they also carry an ethnic background. They also carry religious background. They also may, may or may not, right? They, they may carry um, class background of a certain type and, and so on. So people are not just one identity, right? There right. are many things. And as you said, you know, as far as an umbrella and dealing with, you know, all the multiple issues at the same time, it's really part of that, right? So if we talk about Muslim women's rights or, you know, within a community, we're also dealing with issues of, of class and immigration and, um, and as well as, you know, education and a whole host of other things that go into, um, that go into a woman's, uh, position or positionality within her community. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so the, it is, uh, it right. is, the issues are intersectional, the people are intersectional and certainly activism needs to right. be that. And well. at least we're, we're, we're coming up with, with sensitivity. So, you know, Mary, I, I wanted to ask you when uh -huh. you said something, you, you, so were you sexually assaulted by a nun as well? Yes. So you were. But it, uh, yes, it's an amazing, um, Thing to me that it was only a year ago and I only say my age so you can get a sense of all this I'm 79 now it was a year ago that I finally um, named the event as sexual abuse and perhaps other women may or men may do this where you go you have this experience that is sexual and is abuse but you say or I did, I left it saying, that was weird, that was strange, mm -hmm. um, uh, that was confusing, 
And that's what I did as a very young, uh, I was a postulant at the time. And I just buried it away. And every once in a while, I'd share it. And all of us would say, well, that was weird. Uh, I must mm. tell it because why, why you'll see why we just said that was weird. That was strange. So I was on the postulant line and the novice uh, mistress was walking us back up, uh, up to the novitiate. We had to go through the patio down below where the chapel was and the main convent. And so as I'm following with my line, you ne and you never left that line as a postulant. Uh, a superior tapped me from the convent below, pulled me off the line. And so for me, that would be very frightening, very confusing in itself, and uh, brought me to her room. And in those days, you knelt very close to to the nun when you wanted to ask or or um, share anything to the superior. So, so basically, I'm I'm kneeling very close to her. I don't remember the words before or after, but she took my face between her hands and kissed me all, all over, and I left. And um, mm -hmm. I I believe I had the same feelings as with the priest at seven. I was confused, alone, abandoned. Um, found my group, walked back up the hill, uh, found the group, of it, I believe, but the novice mistress never asked me where I was, and I was probably gone for about 15 minutes. So that's the story that that I held all the time as, that was weird, that was crazy, that was strange. Mm -hmm. But it was a year ago, having done so much work now with those abused by nuns and hearing their very, very sensitive stories that it it forced me uh, in a good sense to say that was sexual abuse so it's only a year ago that i came to terms with that reality mary let me ask you uh, and i don't know if this is a quick question okay and I, and this is something I, uh -huh. i'd like to know from everybody what is it that you want to have happen What's your that goal? Happened back yeah, then. for the work. No, now for the work you're doing, based on where you've come. What is? What do you want to accomplish? Well, well, of course, the the truth. You know, the truth. The the passage. The the truth shall set you free can be used in a lot of different ways. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, in truth, there is power. And so, I want the clergy, uh, those who have been abused by priests, want the stories released. Um, they want uh, per perpetrators held accountable, reported to police. Uh, they want the records turned over. And the same for survivors of known abuse. They, they want their perpetrators or those accused of abuse. They want their names in print. They want the, the, the story to become real. Mm -hmm. And in that, they too find, find validation in their lives and their stories. They want those who, who, who are guilty to be removed from their positions, in some case, cases totally removed from the religious community or the priesthood, or removed from children. Everything they need to do to keep children and others safe needs mm -hmm. to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and some really do need financial recompense. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to see that given to them. I speak to many who... Who, who barely have a place to live. They have mental and physical, um, the impact of the sexual abuse, and they don't have money for the treatment they need. They can't get what they need. If some are alcoholic, mm -hmm. a result of abuse have made working difficult for them. So I want their, their day in the sun, so to speak, mm -hmm. where whatever it is they want, they get. And there is there are resources and support to make that happen. Well, that that doesn't sound like too much, and it sounds like a whole lot, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, I mean, exactly. really, when you think about it. But it, you know, I've never spoken to anyone who had been abused by a priest or a nun. So you know, today is a today. Unfortunately, is a good day because I I, I get well, to I, huh. 
I think so. Yeah, Maybe yeah. I think I, just talking about these things is is relevant, you know, because we haven't we haven't spoken about this before, and it's real, and we're talking about things that are real. So, thank you, Mary, for sharing all that. And you're welcome. Yeah. Now Thanks. you're oh, you're very welcome. So, Teresa. Yeah. You know, you said some things that were pretty powerful to me. And yeah. so like the is it what is the thing for you? Uh, one what is the that, thing that you are marking your work on that you are gauging success on? Gosh, that was such a wonderful big question when you had asked it to Mary and I'm like, what is it that I want? I want a church that actually listens to women. I want a church that is radically inclusive. I want inclusive language. I want women preaching. I want, um, I, I am very, I guess, anti-clericalism. I'm not sure how to turn the church. Okay. So let me ask you this question. When you see women doing that, how, what will be the changes? What will we see when we see women as clergy? How will it be? See, I'm not sure. This is such a complicated topic about women becoming clergy because the the system is not going to change just by having, like, you know, a woman become a priest. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's a total, you know, it's really um, a big. Well, what are the women doing? What are the women doing that were ordained? What, how are they, how are they using that? Huh? See, okay, so now that's an interesting thing because I have talked about, talked with Roman Catholic women priests and trying to figure out their leadership style is very different from the Roman Catholic church. And something that um, Olivia Doku had said is that within the Roman Catholic women priests movement, they don't, they focus, they're not authoritarian the Catholic Church is more authoritarian, like they're a dictator. But the um, Roman Catholic women priests, their leadership style is not as, um, oh gosh, what is the word? Controlling? Controlling. I mean, they're, they're, you're right. The thing is that I okay. do think women do, I mean, lead in different ways. Mm-hmm. And I think that the structure of the Catholic Church, you know what? It, 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 you know what? It supports male leadership dominance. And I rather, I do feel like the Roman Catholic women priest movement is what, you know, everyone is included. It's more authentic okay. to what um, Christianity was in Jesus's time. Mm-hmm. I think, um, I, I think it's important that I feel like a challenge for me is that uh, many of the feminists that I know are often now theologians, scholars, but they've left the church. Mm -hmm. And I think the people in the pews need us. For those who are Catholic feminists, I did a presentation um, three weeks ago to some uh, the Sisters of Social Service, and I talked with them about feminist Christologies. Mm -hmm. And it was so empowering to them to hear what women women's contributions are within the academy today and i'm working here with seniors at a catholic girls high school and i'm talking about sir juan inez de la cruz and talking about how you don't have to agree with the church on everything and actually women have offered better um, significant contributions and men have undermined those so i think the work is big and small yeah but the 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 end goal Women being ordained priests is not going to make the changes in the church. Well, you know, we had a, a, a gentleman oh. on a while ago who um, he his church. Um, I mean, he went the you know the regular route and he left the traditional church, created his own church, and they they are working on the rituals because he didn't like he he believed in you know the the he believed in, in, in Christianity, but he didn't believe in the way it was being packaged basically. Yeah. So, you know, I think that that's a, a real important, you know, we, we have to know something about where we're going or what we yeah. want. Even if we don't have to know the end, we just have to know the bits and pieces of what we want. Like I see Sahara, Sahara 
um, with you and your students, I see you, one of the, one of the most delightful things I've heard from you in a way, and then I want to go to the other Sahara too, is kind of, um, understand, like understanding the threat of Islam and what it is and what it isn't, mm-hmm. because with that hanging over our head, there's, we can't see straight about what it is. We, 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 there's no way we can understand if we're so scared of it, you know, and it's interesting to, to so I want to talk to you about that. But before we do, I want to go to the other Sahara. Are you here? Is she still here? She's on mute. She's oh, she's I, off. I think, it, I think she dropped off. Oh, she did. Okay. Well, get, I'm going to have her back on again too. And so I know some about April because April's been on before. April, you're here, right? I am. Yes. So, cause this was a shock. I mean, Mormon. I mean, we have a woman who is like, you know, strong in the Mormon church was astounding to me. That's how this whole thing got opened up. So Give a little bit more about that and what you're looking for. And then we're going to go back to Sahara about, you know, desensit- you know, about the Islam. But go ahead. Tell us some, because I think some of our audience could be new. And what you're I looking think that for. One thing about my faith, which is pretty much in common with many of the other faiths, since I've talked to people of many different faith communities, is that there are different ways to interpret the theology. And you can interpret it in an expansive way that is inclusive of everyone and that allows for really progressive views. Or you can interpret it in a very patriarchal way, which brings women down and also other people, often people of marginalized genders and of different races, different ethnicities, different socioeconomic statuses. And so there are different ways to interpret the theology. And unfortunately, because historically men have had so much power and patriarchal religious traditions, they are often interpreting the theology in a way that is harmful to women. And because women are excluded so much, we find there's kind of a chain reaction that comes from that, where because women are excluded from positions of leadership within their faith community, including mine, they the men in power, sometimes intentionally and sometimes completely obliviously because they just don't have women at the table to let them know when they're doing things that are harmful to women, start to cause these problems. And one thing that we do see that's really frightening within very patriarchal, both secular traditions and religious traditions is we see a lot of abuse happening. We do find that when a community is more egalitarian, whether it is a secular community or a religious community, that women are safer. That's just something that happens in more egalitarian communities. And so that's something that a lot of women within my faith are working toward. We do love the theology in many ways, and there are ways to interpret it that are simply beautiful and wonderful. And that's true of most faith traditions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and I and it's interesting because I totally agree with you as about the interpretation. I mean, I always say about a lot of rules, like who made them anyway? You know, I mean, who yeah. started the interpretation and who, you know, we just kind of went along for the ride. But when you look at, you know, when you really get into it, I mean, really, what is it saying? So, Sahara, I, I you're, oh, she is? Okay. Sahara, are you here? Khan? Oh, the, is, I had- yeah. Problem. Okay, there you are. So I don't know if you heard some of what um, we've been talking about, and and everybody's kind of talking about in in some ways their own thing, but then there's this overlapping thing that is just there. So because we, we want to get a lot out at one time, so we've been talking some about what the game is, what the outcome is for each of you in the work that you're doing. What do you see as your uh, your main goal. So what would be, I, and I know what you said early on that you're there getting the information out, right? That's your main goal. And is there something that you see in getting it out? Do you see a resistance? Do you see an opening of a heart? What do you see? Um, so, yeah, so I mean, like, as you mentioned, really, um, getting the information out, but really is having people start these conversations because they don't mm. think Having these conversations at a large scale in the community, there's like, you know, it feels like we're preaching to the converted, but even there, you know, people have been struggling with a lot of these ideas for a while and they just haven't had 
um, access to like scholarly information um, talking about these issues. And so uh, one of the things that I see happens as this information gets out to more and more people that, um, you know, especially within younger people that we um, are able to have these in like um, the community itself, maybe through more panels or town halls or discussion groups. And it's something that at least people talk about. And um, we're so early stage that I can't think about sort of reform at this point, but at some point I would like to, you know, see reform like an example be, I've actually been talking about this um, on Facebook for the last couple of days, but marriage contracts, right? So marriage contracts in the Muslim community, you sign a civil contract, of course, but there's also a religious contract that a lot of Muslims um, use uh, in, in Muslim countries. It might be the uh, same as a civil contract, it's a legal contract, but the U.S., uh, people may sign as it an additional thing, but it's um, still maybe legal. And so, you know, a lot of the ways that these things were, were based on patriarchal assumptions about the role of men and women in marriage. Um, and of course, we're talking about heterosexual marriage here. So I just want to start off with that. But, um, you know, so in, in that sense, I want people to think about, you know, how would you change it to make it more egalitarian? And how do you unpack the assumptions that are uh, baked into like those and and so and how are they actually affecting uh, women today are some of these things no longer relevant and if not like how do we change at this point in time we're not really having those conversations here um i've seen some work like for example in the uk there's groups muslim uh, lawyers groups that are putting out like alternative versions of contracts that are more egalitarian they're encouraging Muslims to use them but they're not um as popular as sort of the standard thing that you use and that's just that's just one example like um, where I would like, so, you know, the first step is just that people don't have this information that's already available out there. We want to start these conversations so that we as a community can um, move forward. And so that's one thing. And then the other thing that it's more outward facing, we've most been like inward facing. But I'm glad we're having conversations like these here because um, there's a lot of conversations within the larger feminist community where problems are generally left out of. Um, and I think, you know, the, um, I'm going to create a little bit of trouble here in this uh, in this show. One of the things that um, was said earlier on, and I can't remember who said it, but it was, you know, this is something that people assume that, um, you know, the work of like freedom and liberation of women is not going on in the Muslim community. And that's just, um, and, you know, this is something that I've seen my entire life. I grew up in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, and there's been never a shortage of women fighting for our rights. And it's uh, it's really a failure of like Western media or rather the bias of Western media mm -hmm. not told. And so there's women in the feminist movement here that are just not aware of the work that Muslims have been doing for centuries. And so, um, so that's, that's I don't think, I don't think a lot. I mean, I'm not aware of all the work that's being done. I mean, I'm not reading all of your materials and I'm not in your classrooms and I'm, you know, I don't know all the work that's being done. So I'm in, you know, I'm in awe of the fact that, you know, you have, you know, this is going on in general. And my, and my question is, who is your biggest roadblock? Who's making it the hardest for change to happen? Like whether it's a marriage contract, wh wh I mean, whatever it is, it, I mean, who's Man. saying no? Men. Men. And how Man are they... Are. Go ahead. And who, how are they saying, how are men saying no? Who said that? Mary. Mary. Mary, how are men saying it's, no? It's, well, historically, we all know it. We've been saying it. They hold the power, have held the power. They control the narrative. They control the dialogue. Most leaders around the world are male um, and have always been the ones who who control and even from the religious perspective as has so, been said so if that's the case women, so if that's the case how have you how have you gotten this far that's so, well a, a lot of hard work so so <laughs> and, yeah so how have you gotten this far how is the work that you're doing being received mm -hmm. If I mean with the roadblocks, so, so, and I think Sahar, you got a smile on your face. So, mm -hmm. can you answer that? Sure. I mean, I think for particularly for Muslim communities, it's not 
you know, just generic men. It's actually particularly, you know, um, sort of two fronts, the roadblocks coming on two fronts, one being um, the from outside of the community, right? So outside of Muslim faith tradition, there's plenty of stereotypes about Muslim women and um, Muslim women's positionality, their history, their lives, their lifestyles, um, their status, and so on and so forth, which is very sensationalized. Um, historically, it was about um, the narrative was about how Muslim women are um, are scantily clad and sexually promiscuous and available for men. Mm -hmm. And now the, it's it, the the external um, stereotype is sort of the opposite that they are that they are um, completely veiled and covered and secluded and 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 um, sequestered in, in right. sheltered right. spaces. And so that, I mean, that narrative shift is sort of two sides of the same coin of, mm -hmm. of this eroticism and, and mystique of, of Muslim women coming from the outside world uh, placed onto Muslim women. Um, and, and Muslim men become very aware of this, right? Be that one of the major stereotypes about Islam, apart from the whole, um, you know, uh, Muslims are violent nonsense, um, is the gender stereotypes, right? And so Muslim men are very aware of this. And it, and one of the things that Muslim women have to deal with then is the fact that we are told constantly that, uh, you know, Islam itself and Muslims itself as a community as a whole are under attack. And so right now is not the time to deal with Muslim women's issues or specific issues, you know, whether it's marriage contracts or, or, or access to, um, you know, the mosque, uh, access space in the mosque, egalitarian space in the mosque or egalitarian decision-making within the community, wh whatever the issues are, right? Um, that the idea that now is not the time because we, are, we have larger mm -hmm. fish to fry as a, as a community. Mm -hmm. And so that pressure from within is actually, is actually, um, placed from without, right? So from outside of the community, and and that's um, and that's something that is a is sort of a, a, a what we call like I guess a double patriarchy, right? Double double patriarchal issues that Muslim women have to deal with. It's um, and a lot of it is originating from outside of the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's okay. and and a lot of that you know bigotry and and stereotypes about Muslims in general is is you know coming from you know r racism and xenophobic um, attitudes um that that then get filtered in to muslim communities and muslim communities then um and particularly muslim men react to it by becoming more and more insular and conservative and so muslim women then have to deal with that um yeah so um, I mean, as far as your question about, you know, what's, what do you want to see and mm -hmm. what's the end goal? I think for me in particular, and, and I'm so glad that I'm able to have partners like Zara Khan and, and, um, and Fitna, the feminist uh, troublemakers of North America, because the end goal is for me is to, to, to produce the scholarship, but also to help to get it out there. Right. Um, in terms of, um, in, both within the community and uh, and outside of the community, um, to talk about more about inclusion, right? So inclusivity, sort of as a broad. If I wanted to use one term as to what the end goal is, it's inclusivity, right? Inclusivity mm -hmm. in terms of you know of um, the ideas about gender have been so far within the Muslim tradition have been patriarchal, have been male dominated. So inclusivity of women's voices, women's experiences, um, even women in scholarship, right? So scholarship about Islam happens to be a male dominated field, right? Islamic studies happens to be a male dominated field. Um, but women scholars then are able to, you know, even if they are not specifically studying questions of gender, when women scholars do that, do scholarship, they are automatically not necessarily uh, assuming male um, male normativity. Of course, many are because that's how we've been trained. But um, but the idea is that when you have inclusivity, right? When you have more women at the table, whether it's at like the the, the executive board of a mosque or a, in or in a or in a in a in a Muslim school or in a in a given community, you know, or 
or even you know within a family, when you have Muslim women or when you have women as uh, as leaders and as people with respected mm -hmm. voices, mm -hmm. the idea is that the end result will be less bias, will be more right. egalitarian. As I, I think, so that's um, all women. We need all. We need. We need all women coming to the table, not just not, you know, we need, I mean, I'm Jewish. We need all women coming to the table. Sure. So, absolutely. Right. So we can spread. So we spread this, uh, this, this, this stuff that we spread with what we need to have going on, what we need. Cause you know, I mean, I, 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 I work with a lot of men in my practice. I work with a lot of women, but mm -hmm. I work with a lot of men and I'm finding men to just be, you know, I, and I like men. I mean, I didn't always like men. I can't say growing up a Jewish, you know, in a Jewish family, you know, very strong Jewish energy, male energy. I didn't always like men. You know, they scared me, you know. But now when I'm out in the world and I'm grown up and I see the, what they don't seem to know, what they can't seem to express, what they want to express, what they're waiting for us to say, in a lot of cases, I'm finding that I want to help more men. We can't, you know, I'm, I, I, Mm -hmm. I'm the founder of a networking organization for women, you know, and there's lots of things men, we don't let men come to, but I feel like we've got to bring everybody yeah. to the table. So I was going to say, you know, mm -hmm. this is a fast show, fast and dirty. You know, either, all of you have had just a little bit of time to really express yourself. So I want to invite you all back, you know, individually, if you will come and share more in depth about what you're doing, but I'm also curious about you're bringing men on, you know, mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. involved, not involved, have things to say so that we can open up the dialogue mm -hmm. grander, you know, yeah. is that yeah. possible? Yeah. 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 You know? Cause yeah. men have to see men role models. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What were you going to say, Sahara? I see your mouth moving. But like, um, you know, for me, uh, for the work that I'm doing, that actually sounds very difficult because unfortunately, like this is not just a Muslim problem, but all male panels is like a global problem, really, in like pretty much every field. And so um, I think men have had a lot of time to say what they want to say, and it's time to give women the, the microphone. And so, I mean, for me, really, like if I'm organizing an event, I'm not going to give the space, the platform to men. I'm going to okay. invite but I want the audience to be mixed and so that's really one of the problems is like mm -hmm. when women speakers are invited to mosques they're for a women only audience or they're talking about a topic that's specifically about women and so they're not really held as experts in like a wide variety of fields like men are and so that's one of the things that I want to um, challenge and um, I guess like one other thing that I would add is like a lot of our work is within the Muslim community but one thing I want to talk about is how we can collaborate across mm -hmm. different communities and one of the things that I'd like to request my um, Christian and Jewish and other colleagues is to when you know let's say your church or your synagogue or your interfaith group organizing an event where you're inviting a Muslim leader to speak don't always invite the imams invite some female scholars to speak as well oh. but the really mm -hmm. common things works me to no end is when interfaith panels invite men to talk about the topic of women in Islam. It's just like, it's just, it, you know, yeah, I mean, it seems I kind of strange, doesn't it? Like my synagogue, we invite, um, we, I mean, we have panels of all shapes and sizes and colors and things, but I have to agree with you. And I wasn't going to Sahara, but I have to, because I have done, pa I've done uh, what we call round tables with my women's group. And I will invite men to facilitate whatever conversation it is. And men I have found have a harder time. And this is not a judgment because I love men. They have a harder time facilitating a conversation as opposed to talk, as opposed to just holding the mic and talking. I mean, so I, I, think, I mean, I, I wanted to add on to what I yeah. was saying. I completely agree that, um, you know, that men have actually had plenty of time to, to, um, to voice their opinions and they have had so much time in the spotlight. Um, and so actually it's not, um, we're not doing a disservice to them by, by focusing by on women's voices in particular, but in order to um, address that question of including men within, within an audience or within, um, within our discussions, within movements and, and our efforts and so on, um, the question that you were asking Marilyn, I think it has, 
um, one of the things that I've done, both in my scholarship, but as well as in my teaching and in general, in my approach to um, Muslim feminism, um, is the is to take seriously, very seriously, the category of gender as not women just having gender, mm -hmm. and that everybody actually has gender. And I mean, apart from the fact that I don't believe that gender is binary and so on and so forth, um, I also think that in particularly if you talk about men as having gender and what that means for men um, and talking about masculinity and concepts of masculinity that, that Muslim men in particular have grown up with, I think is a really important step to, um, to having men sort of uh, think reflectively about their position and how they may have been, um, you know, taking advantage of their privilege or what kind of privileged space that they occupy mm -hmm. and how that affects the women in their lives, um, whether at work or at home right. or in the mosque or whatever. And so really talking seriously about masculinity, it may or may not, you know, be a way to include men, but certainly yeah. addresses um, many of the issues that um, that come up when we talk about women only is, is to actually talk about men too. So I and I, I agree with it all. That's I think part of my my personal problem is that I agree with it all. I feel like yeah, women get the mic, and yeah, but how can we have the mic if men aren't you know aren't gonna you know be listening? And you know we got to open these conversational stuff. So I think what I would ask each of you, if you're interested and willing, is to you know, kind of pick a topic that you feel is pertinent to the work you're doing, who you are in the work and where you're going. And then let's build a individual shows around each of you. Cause I want to know more like Mary. I want to know more. I want to know more about your experience. I want to know more about, you know, the people that you're involved with. I want to, but I also want to know the good. I want to know the good that's being done, not just, yeah. you know, I want to know the good that's being mm -hmm. done that's that's moving forward not just the 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 tough road but the good the the things that you're yeah. accomplishing yeah. so if you would be willing you know i would love to have you each back to explore more in an hour of you know of whatever topic yeah. you you choose if that's okay with all of you mm -hmm. yeah cuz oh, yeah cuz this was just an hors d'oeuvre i want more <laughs> right so Right. Uh, April, I'm going to come back to you. Okay. Because you helped start all this. So based on like what you know, based on what you heard, based on, you know, what you know is going on, what was the final wisdom from today, would you say? And was there some one little nugget that you could like summarize? I think a lot of us talked about how women are people and we have a lot of different forces that are working against us and for us also and mm -hmm. so when we look at a woman and we want to help a woman we have to help the whole woman we can't just say well we're helping women today and so today we're not worried about whether she's latina or whether she's muslim or whether she's catholic we have to help the entire person and that is something that's i think we're trying to, to get better at mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I yeah, that's exactly what I heard. What were you going to say, Teresa? You sound like you had something else to add. Well, I'm just really excited about having this conversation. That um, what I'm hearing is it's re it's really important. So in in our lives, we've been able to have an opportunity to articulate our voice mm -hmm. within religious context where we've been silenced. So I guess if anything, like whether you're an educator or an activist, our I I think it's our you know, my passion to let other women have their voice. Okay. You know, so, um, and that will lead hopefully to more inclusive um, spaces for women and affirming spaces for women. Absolutely. And unfortunately, uh, we're on that hour. That's why it went, I ah. was just, I know, I want more. Mary, I want to hear Me more too. from you and Teresa yeah. and both Saharas oh, yeah. and, and, and uh, yeah, I want to hear more about all this. So um, I'm going to come, come back around and we'll connect with each of you and invite you back on and let's pick a subject that we, you know, and, and explore it even more. Okay. 
Excellent. Thank okay. you so Terrific. much. Terrific. Thank you so nice much. To meet and everyone. April, thank you for helping yes. put this together. Yes, April. You're welcome. Thank you all so much. And thank you, everyone out there, for being with us today. And we will see you very, very Oops. soon. Oh, yeah, my books, four of them on Amazon. Well, one's not there yet, but it's coming. In Just One Afternoon, Listening to the Hearts of Men. In Just One Afternoon, Twins, Millennials, and Soon, Opioid. Um, People impacted by opioid addiction. And then after that will be black fathers and families that have lost a child and then surviving rape and sexual abuse. So be on the lookout for more from me and more shows and all of that. And because we too like to offer a voice to, mm -hmm. to unvoiced, well, a voice to unvoiced. Yeah. Bye everybody. Bye. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archive section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net. <laughs>